They follow a very simple Russian military principle, which says if you attrit one third of an opposing force, uh, if you jam one third of an opposing force, so you use electronic warfare, then the remaining third of that combat force will cease to become militarily effective. Russia has a long history of electronic warfare that dates to before the Soviet Union, but especially it took off in the USSR. The history of EW in the Soviet Union is important, not only because it shapes the Russian approach, but because of course the Ukrainian military legacy is also tied to the Soviet Union. So we can expect them to have, with of course changes and tactical innovation, just like on the Russian side, across time and space, a similar know-how and a way of framing EW in operations. The Russians particularly are enthusiastic users of electronic warfare. They always have been. They are credited with the first ever use of electronic warfare during the Russo-Japanese War in the early 20th century. And they place, place a very high emphasis on integrating electronic warfare with their ground forces units. And they do this because they follow a very simple Russian military principle, which says if you attrit one third of an opposing force, uh, if you jam one third of an opposing force, so you use electronic warfare, then the remaining third of that combat force will cease to become militarily effective. Now, this doesn't matter in Russian military thinking, whether it's a squad of, say, five troops, a platoon of 10 troops, or whether it's a corps or an army, the principle remains the same. So Russia's been using EW with varying degrees of success alongside its land forces, not only since the 2022 invasion began, but also since the first invasion of Ukraine in 2014. For this one, it serves to make a quick timeline into EW operations in Ukraine. There is no clear delimitation between different periods except for one, and that's the main shift in EW operations after the initial invasion. So let's contrast an initial period of invasion in 2022 with the period that followed, and then zoom out to talk about the wider experiences and the lessons learned at the NATO level. Remember, of course, that with every week and month, we know more and more about what happened in the past months of the war. So this video sums up the situation based on present information. The initial Russian attack saw a lot of Russian EW activity to blind the Ukrainian defenses and interfere with their command and control as part of an offensive counter-air operation OCA, to then destroy the Ukrainian air force and suppress Ukrainian air defenses. In this, they were successful. Several Ukrainian fixed radar installations were destroyed and air defenses and fighter aircraft had to quickly disperse which limited their ability to react to the Russian attack. Russia has been using electronic warfare as an integral part of its air campaign against the Ukrainian Air Force. Part of that dimension includes the use of electronic warfare. And electronic warfare has been used by the Russians um, primarily to try and jam Ukrainian radars, to try and jam Ukrainian radio communications as part of that OCA effort. Now, not strictly electronic warfare, but I would argue it falls within the EW remit, the Russians have also been using anti-radiation missiles, anti-radar missiles, um, which they're launching from their aircraft and they're trying to attack Ukrainian uh, radars on the ground with that. And the reason being for that is to try and reduce the effectiveness of the Ukrainian air defense system. Ultimately, Russia was unsuccessful in achieving their goal of destroying the Ukrainian air force and Ukrainian air defenses. It also appears that Russian EW efforts were uncoordinated and interfering with their own ground operation. And this was exploited by the Ukrainian armed forces. Weaknesses in command and control compounded Russia's inability to gain control of the air. A lack of planning and preparedness, coupled with procurement and encryption key distribution issues, forced many units to use civilian handheld radios and mobile phones, instead of secure, jam-resistant tactical radios. Additionally, the failure to deconflict EW activities with the rest of their operations led to unintentional jamming of their own forces. Ukrainian EW forces exploited these weaknesses by eavesdropping on Russia's unencrypted transmissions, jamming their communications, and performing targeting for long-range weapons using direction-finding techniques. 
The most important takeaway from this initial period is that in the air domain, the Russian aerospace forces, the VKS, followed the rulebook and made an all-out effort to establish air superiority through an EW-assisted OCA campaign. And they could have turned that air superiority then into air supremacy, allowing the VKS to strike Ukrainian positions with impunity. For a few days, they succeeded, and this success contrasts sharply with the Grand Offensive. However, ultimately, they did not destroy the vast majority of Ukrainian aircraft and air defenses which dispersed, reset and took up the fight. And this sets up the next phase. Throughout 2002 and in 2003, Russia remains in a stronger position in the air, at least on paper. It appears unable or unwilling to press this advantage. Russia appears to conduct successful EW on a tactical and operational level, but it does not mount a similar EW effort as in the initial weeks of the invasion. Instead, the air war has shifted from strategic goals to operational and tactical ones. And Russia relies on standoff attacks and, where possible, it uses EW, of course, to support airstrikes in order to create a temporary uh, permissive environment in which then the Ukrainian communication systems, its radar and also its UAVs are targeted. For this, Russia uses ground and air-based systems. With EW, Russia has targeted navigational systems, Starlink and is reported to have intercepted and decrypted Ukrainian communications. It is presently unknown how widespread or comprehensive this success is. Additionally, Russia started to target UAV operations with EW quite early on, contributing to mounting UAV losses. There are also reported incidents that Russia attempted to jam NATO ISR aircraft, or intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance aircraft, that flew over the Black Sea. At the same time, it is reported that Ukraine had similar success, but much less is known about their EW efforts, because most reports that we get in the West are focusing on Russia alone. The introduction of Russian counter UAV systems appears to influence Ukrainian UAV operations, though again, this is not something that is that often reported on. It is however reported that Ukraine had success in jamming key Russian systems such as A-50 and AWACS stable aircraft and they have also destroyed some key EW aircraft on the ground. Crucially too, some Russian EW systems appear to have been captured. Ukraine has captured several high-value Russian EW assets during the conflict and is reported to have handed these over to allied nations for technical intelligence purposes. EW remains important in jamming or spoofing radar and communications, as well as tapping into radio communications of the opposing side. It remains unclear how extensive or successful these efforts are, but given that EW is continuously used and adapts to threats like UAVs, this invisible conflict over the electromagnetic spectrum is here to stay. And this brings us to what experiences and lessons we can currently draw from the Russian-Ukrainian war regarding EW. Before we jump into that, a quick announcement that we are celebrating the launch of a new publication, Tank Assault, in our book series. And you can get this one, plus all the other books that we have already out there, at 15% off during our launch sale. The new book is a faithful translation of the Soviet combat manual for, well, armored and mechanized warfare. And this book provides you with a really unprecedented insight into Soviet tank warfare, which may even influence some of the Russian and perhaps even the Ukrainian ways of fighting in the war right now. Until March 2024, this book is available in the limited bilingual edition. So check it out and pick it up at 15% off with uh, all the other very well received books that we have on German World War II tank and infantry tactics, as well as our hugely successful book on the Stuka and the IS-2. Now let's talk about the main takeaways. I'll be focusing on EW as a whole, rather than the smaller tactical issues so that we don't get lost in the detail. First off, EW is an integral part of warfare. Yeah, Russia's initial success clearly shows the dangers of EW. This is not one of those obvious lessons. If you talk to people in NATO and different air forces and read what they write before the war and now, they will straight out say and admit that EW for a long time was a backbench issue. Western militaries enjoyed connectivity, permissive operational environments, 
and very limited adversary capabilities in the EW domain since the Cold War ended. And the last time the, the West, let's say, really had to worry about all of this was during the Cold War, maybe in Kosovo as well. But in those operations, it wasn't really relevant in the end. But that is more than 20 years ago. Second, EW and space. Now this is new. A couple of people I know in the space domain will have face palms right now. <laughs> I'm gonna get some angry messages. What I want to say is that the Russian Ukrainian war is a contemporary example of why we need to think more about EW and space. Now, those two things have already been connected for a long time, but you know, our navigation and communication systems depend on it. Like, think about a task force in the Pacific. What does it rely on for communication and navigation? Well, satellites. Lose the satellites to jamming or have them fed even with the wrong data, like wrong positional data or even meteorological data, and then Houston, we've got a problem. And this links to my third point. This is the age-old problem of EW. We don't see EW's success. Yeah, EW is slippery, it is in constant flux. It is a game of chess, as somebody once told me, without rules that does not advertise success because that could actually sabotage future operations. But crucially, it doesn't go boom. And boom is important because we can see boom. Take UAV operations in Ukraine. We can see the kinetic application. No one shows that 95 out of 100 cases UAVs are used for reconnaissance and fire control because that just doesn't do well on social media. EW has the same problem. When it works, it's invisible. When it doesn't work, it's invisible. Or another example, when there is a choice between a set of high output antennas, receivers, transmitters that are all installed in some ungainly looking caravan, or we can have a new tank or aircraft, where will our eyes go? It's probably not gonna be the caravan, but that's just my guess. When it comes down to it, however, we need navigational data. We need situational data. We need communication. And we need to make sure that the adversary doesn't have it. The side that dominates EW is going to be one step ahead. It operates with an advantage in situational awareness, force cohesion, connectivity, battle space shaping, multi-domain operations, and all the other buzzwords you can think about. And yes, that side will reap the benefits on the tactical, operational, and strategic level. Big thank you here to patrons and channel members for your support. Remember also that book sale that is currently going on with a hefty discount on all our books available for sale at the moment. And also thank you to Andrew and Bernard Cast from Military History Visualized for their fire support on this video. I hope all of you have a great one and see you in the sky.